Adam Leipzig is a film producer, former studio executive. He's an author and creative consultant. He's been responsible for a lot of hits. Uh, he worked at Walt Disney, at uh, Interscope, which was a studio in the past, but also he was president of National Geographic Films. Some of the movies that he's worked on or produced, you would probably recognize everything from the big hit, March of the Penguins, National Geographic, to Honey, I Shrunk the Kids at Disney, uh, Good Morning Vietnam, uh, a lot of uh, great shows. He's also uh, been responsible over the years for $2, million, $2 billion, sorry Adam, $2 billion, with a B, uh, in uh, movie receipts and grosses on budgets of about $300 million. So that's a pretty good track record. Uh, we're really delighted to welcome Adam Leipzig here today. Thank you, Hoyt. It's so good to be here. Well, Adam, I, uh, I know that people are out in the audience are going to be really interested in how you got into producing. Did you decide at five years old that just what you always wanted to be is a film producer? Is your, is your family in the show business world? Or? My family is definitely not in the business. Uh, but yes, I think at about five years old, I knew I wanted to be a producer. Is that right? But I didn't know what, if it was film or theater or anything. I just liked getting things organized and a little bit telling people what to do. <laughs> so it was either that or being a general or I think a president. Like, exactly, right. Yeah, yeah. Where did you grow up? Are you from California originally? I grew originally? up in Reseda, okay. in the Valley. And then I went away to college and I started, my first career was in theater. Well, I started in theater and I, started, I became a producer while I was in theater. Did you do uh, high school productions? Were you acting, directing? I, I did direct and did a little bit of acting in high school, but really more producing. Isn't that interesting? Because a lot of times you find producers are at, people who are actors aspiring yeah. and they couldn't do it or they wanted to be writers. But to find somebody who knew at that age that you wanted to be a producer is really interesting. You know, early on in my theater career, uh, I think everybody thinks that they want to, want to direct. I know certainly in movies everybody wants to be a director. So early in my theater career, I decided I wanted to direct something. And I tried to direct something. Yeah. I discovered I'm not a director. Huh. I just, I don't have that chip in my head. So what's the sort of difference between being a producer and being a director? Because some people probably don't understand what those different functions are. Can you explain that for us a little? Yeah, the, uh, the director holds the, the singular creative vision mm -hmm. for the show and is also really responsible for communicating with actors. This is where I fell down as a director. I, I, mean, I can have lunch and dinner and coffee and tea with actors, but if an actor asked me to give her notes on her performance to make her performance better, I, that's just, I don't speak that language. That's not where I go. Yeah. Uh, the producer's job is to hold the entire production in their hands. Yeah. From soup to nuts and make sure that the whole ecosystem that needs to be there so everybody can do their best creative work is there for them. Well, uh, th although it's true, isn't it, that producers have a big creative role in the process, too, in film, uh, certainly mm. in theater, and in, 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 in every endeavor I can think sure. of. Sure. It is a completely creative role, but it's a different creative role. And you're solving creative problems at different levels. Sometimes your creative problem is, how do you get 100 elephants on the hill by sunrise tomorrow to make Oliver Stone happy? <laughs> and sometimes the creative problem is, how do you fix the third act? Right, because people think about producers as just the money guys, and in some cases in Hollywood there are producers who get producer credit who are the money people, but really it's a long involved process from my understanding yeah. of uh, developing the film, developing the script, hiring the location, raising the money, distribution, there are all these different elements All, all to the it. way through that chain. There are very few people who are high net worth enough to really be the money person. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's one of the ways this business has shifted in the past few years. There are now a few very high net worth individuals who actually are able to finance movies out of their own bank accounts, and they've helped us get some really great movies. True. Uh, Megan Ellison is a perfect case in point. Yeah. Uh, but most of the time, movies are so expensive that you need to have institutional financing, like studios right. or many studios or different production companies coming together collaboratively to finance. And the producer's job is not to actually pull out the checkbook and write the check, but rather to corral all of that money and then put it to the best purpose and make sure the movie comes in at a high level of excellence on yeah. time, uh, on budget gets released at the right Yeah, way. I was going to say, it's not just enough to be writing the checks. Right. You really have to have the other, some of the other skills, yeah. and most of the other skills, really. 
So uh, let's talk about how you learned all those skills. Uh, I know you started in the theater, mm -hmm. and I know you also started at a place called the Los Angeles Theater Center, which was in an old downtown bank building mm -hmm. and was funded, as I recall, by some city money uh, to develop theater in Los Angeles. It was one of the early... Uh, I guess one of the early efforts to to get theater and going, which is now, of course, booming in L.A. But tell us about that experience, because that was pretty much one of your first producing jobs, I think. Yeah, in fact, uh, I started at the company that birthed the Los Angeles Theater Center. That company was called the Los Angeles Actors Theater. It was run by Diane White and Bill Bushnell. And uh, we found this bank building at Fifth and Spring Street uh, in downtown Los Angeles in 19... 13 vintage Security Pacific Bank building that had fallen into disuse. And it still exists as the LATC. It's you still, can go there it's to still see exists. plays. It's yeah. still a four theater performing arts complex. We had city money, state money, county money, federal money, and private investment all mushed together. Two floors of a downtown law firm working on the deal for about a year. Yeah. One of the most complicated real estate transactions that's actually ever happened in the state of California. Wow. And we opened, um, and it was a gigantic success. And even though that company no longer exists as a company, that building stands. It is still run by the people who at the time were the Latino Theater Lab and now are the Latino Theater Company who now have the lease and operate uh, the building. So, yeah, it was it, very so the legacy lives. It was in innovative as I remember because it was a little like the public theater in mm -hmm. New York where yeah. you had an old old building and you renovated, I believe there were at least four theater There's spaces. Four theaters. So, and our, our model actually was Joe Papp's public theater. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was a great addition to downtown. It took a long time for downtown to develop around the LATC, Indeed. but that's really happened. We were a little before our time. So you produced and, and you were a dramaturg, literary manager mm -hmm. at LATC. Uh, how did you get into studio work or film producing? You know, at a certain point, um, I just grew tired of theater. I wanted to work on a larger canvas. I wanted to work for larger audiences and have, do shows that had more of an impact with more people. So I quit the theater. Uh, and I decided I was going to go out and prospect in the movie world. I knew nothing about movies. So cold turkey, you went, you I just, I just said, didn't have a job, you just left. I didn't have a job. I just said, I'm going to go off and cool. go figure it out. Yeah. Um, and I just went out and started meeting people in the movie business, figuring out what place I might fit in. It was a time that... Uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg and Michael Eisner, two iconic and legendary executives, yeah. uh, had uh, recently gone over to Walt Disney Pictures to revive that studio, and they hired me. Jeffrey became one of my mentors, and uh, thereby hangs a tale. Well, now, what's, how do you prepare for that, for your first job as a film producer? Uh, I know you had a theater background, mm -hmm. and you had a... Probably uh, you had yeah. a BA from a good school and everything, but what did what the heck did you know about it, right? I, I learned by doing it. And when you're in, you know when you work at a studio, you're not producing; you're an executive. Yeah. So you're the executive in charge of production. You're supervising the entire project from the studio's perspective. I actually learned after I left the studio and became a producer that I knew nothing about making movies while I was being an executive because I had not produced a movie. I had just supervised movies from an executive's chair. And that was a very different experience. So I had a whole other learning curve later in my career. The learning curve at the studio was there were eight of us from Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg and five other people and then me at the bottom. And I learned by doing and learned by absorbing from people who were wiser than I was. Uh -huh. and, it's, and that job as a studio exec is to really to oversee production, essentially. You don't do development so much. Actually, or you, you do. do. You, you do develop, development. You, 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 you have to acquire the ideas. You, you know, you're acquiring the scripts that the, that, or the ideas or the books or any of the, or the life rights, any of the foundational material on which a movie may be based. When you do that, you're making a predictive assumption that in three to five years when that movie comes out, the mm -hmm. audience will be there to meet it. Right. It'll, hit the, it'll hit the audience interest curve. Uh, you have to hire the writers give the development notes, shape the script, hold the vision for what that movie is going to be, and then bring in the director, the cast, watch all the dailies, supervise production from the studio's level, yeah. and then take it all the way through marketing and distribution. And I guess you have to fight the politics of the studio or whatever the direction or the trends are and uh, the personalities that you deal with. I've heard that studios have politics. <laughs> I, I hear that they're even worse than national politics sometimes. Is that true? Well, Is that possible? Possibly at Disney. <laughs> I don't know what you cast I'm not sure. It's, I don't think that they're worse than what's going on in Congress right now. I don't think Probably so. right. Uh, great. So... What's the background for somebody? What's the best training for somebody who wants to be a film producer or wants to be a studio executive? 
curiosity. Mm -hmm. My degree is in literature. I use it all the time uh, because I care about story and character, emotion, how things affect the audience. I think being curious and always asking questions uh, are really good traits to have. I don't think that there's one background. And if it, in fact, if you look at all the people who work in the media field, mm. in the many media fields, we come from so many different backgrounds. There are so many different pathways that we followed to get to where we are. There's not one, there's not one track that gets you there. Uh, so I think, it's, I think curiosity and an ability to always um, really want to work with great people. Um, they are great people yourself. too. I, I yeah. found when I, I came from New York and I was a playwright in New York and I was a New York snob and I moved to LA uh -huh. and I thought, oh, these are going to be a bunch of bimbos in the TV and film business. Yeah. But I actually found an incredibly high level of intellectual capacity, curiosity and passion about the craft. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that people don't understand and the, also the frustrations at times among the studio people or the TV people about what they're producing and the mm -hmm. audience they're, they're looking at. Yeah. But it, it is a very interesting and diverse group, as you said. I think it's the best group of people in the world. I think it's the most interesting business in the world. Yeah, I, well, l let's talk a little bit about um, after the studio experience, and you got that. You said it's really different going from being a studio executive to being a, a producer and actually yeah. producing movies. Right. Give us, what was the next phase here for you in your career? Well, at a certain point at the studio, um, that those eight people that I mentioned had grown to 130. We had split into three different divisions. Um, if you last long enough, you get promoted. So I'd been promoted and promoted and promoted. So I was many levels from the people who were actually on the set making the movies. And that wasn't why I got into the business. I wanted to make the movies. You so felt like a suit rather than a producer. I was a suit. In fact, when I would visit the set, you would hear in the distance, suit on the set. Uh, <laughs> and I would. <laughs> where, where? I would have to shield my eyes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I quit that job and became a producer. Uh, Again, that's a cold, cold turkey quit, right? You, yeah. you don't have any income necessarily that's coming in. You're, yeah. Did you take projects with you? Or? I didn't take projects with me. I had a pretty good idea where I was going to go. I ended up going to Interscope because I had relationships there. Okay. However, um, you know, so, so the first day you're on the set as a producer, me, yeah. and suddenly you realize this whole thing is on your shoulders. If you make the day or not, which means if you actually get shot, all the scenes you're supposed to shoot, and you finish on time, and the scenes look good, it's all on you. That level of crushing responsibility yeah. was something I had never really encountered before. Well, and before. also you have responsibility to investors yeah. and to the audience. You want to make a great movie, but you yeah. also, you've got budget issues that you yeah. have to worry about too. Is that a tough one with creatives? Always. Always. <laughs> but, and that's also our job, yeah. right? Because it's the director's job to say, I want 100 elephants. It's producer's job to say, we can only afford 14. And then you have to figure it out. But the, producer, the director's got to push for, for his or her vision, because if he doesn't, then the director's not doing his job. Well, let's talk about actors for a minute, though. Okay. Because the actor might say, well, I want my writer for the rewrite, and I want you to pay him a half million dollars mm -hmm. for the three weeks of a rewrite. Yes. Or I want more lines in, my, uh, in the show. What, well, how do you deal with the, the, the actor t uh, folks? Well, who's the actor making this request for? Right? Because depending on who the actor is, I might just say yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what level would that be? That would be pretty high. Yeah. yeah. But beyond that, you can, you can be the tough guy. Yes. And I have come to respect what actors do so much. What actors do is so hard, I could never, ever do that. Forget about the emotional stress of going on auditions and having to do this. What actors have to do is know where their character is at every moment in a two-hour movie, but we're shooting out of sequence. Yes. So in the morning, she might be shooting a scene that happens in the last five minutes of the film, and then in the afternoon, a scene that happens on page 60, and at the, at the end of the day, a scene that happens on page two. And she has to know the arc of her character and where her character is emotionally, all the things that have happened, and come in and say these lines, and then say it again and again and again, 20 or 30 times for the master shot and the close-up and right. the two shot and the over the shoulder. So at 10 o'clock she's weeping over her divorce. Every time on a certain line, if she picks up a cup of water, yeah. she has to pick it up on exactly the same line so it matches, and she's got to remember that every time. Yeah. It's incredible. It is. So I, I know that there are some people who say actors are, actors want too much and they, they're too high maintenance. I think actors should have everything they need because what they have to do is so difficult to do. Yeah. yeah. Amen. I, I agree. Yeah. I found that to be true. 
Uh, and also they inspire the material. Mm -hmm. I know as a writer, mm -hmm. they, uh, when you see an actor uh, read your lines and bring a character to life, right. it's, uh, it's profound. Yeah. So Interscope, um, that's a, a production company, yeah. essentially it was, yeah. and uh, one of the majors at that point. But you weren't on your own producing, you're producing through an organization. And what's that experience? I know what it might be like on the set, but... Uh, well, it's, you know, Interscope was a company that was funded by uh, a Dutch company, Phil, uh, Polygram, which in turn was part of Philips. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a moneyed production company. And it was, it was nice. It was small and boutique-y. Uh, we had our own checkbook. Yeah. We distributed through Disney. Did you find the material was different when you were there from Disney? Obviously, we, it I would mean, be, we had but. we had we had more autonomy in the selection of material. We had to please a smaller number of people because we were not as many people as at the studio. Mm -hmm. Well, then yeah. after Interscope, you went out on your own, I did. didn't you, for a while? I did. And I quit that job too. You quit that yeah. job too. Cold yeah. Turkey is the theme. Yeah. Uh, and I know you had an independent production company. I so, did. Yeah. Dare, that's all on you money, everything. Exactly. And uh, was that one, what did you produce there? Did You, well, you did developed uh, a lot of material. We I'm developed sure. a lot of material. Uh, the, the, the show that uh, many people know was Julie Taymor's first movie called Titus, uh, based on Julie Taymor being a stage director originally for The Lion King exactly. and other big... So this, this was her first, she's now, she's since directed Frida and Across the Universe um, and many other stage productions. This was her first uh, film production based on Titus Andronicus with Tony Hopkins and Jessica Lange and Alan Cumming, Harry Lennox, fabulous cast. Um, really tough shoot, but really worth it. Where I think did you shoot? We shot in Rome and Croatia. Beautiful movie. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of the film. I think it's one of the best Shakespeare adaptations that's ever been done. I think Julie's a genius. Um, so that was different. And at the same time, I launched a consulting company to bring non to bring entertainment industry smarts and techniques and wisdom to non-entertainment companies. Uh, so that's something that I've been doing in parallel. Yeah, I, I want to talk about that because yeah. that's fascinating because I'm sure there's a market and an audience for this uh, in every field. Yeah. Let's just wrap a little bit more on your career mm. before we talk about the consulting. You were then uh, became president of National Geographic Films. I did. Tell me about that experience yeah. and what. Well, that was what great. is National Geographic Films? We all know about well, National Geographic. Magazine National Geographic Films was a uh, it, and it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it was a feature film division from the mothership, National Geographic Society. Mm -hmm. We were based in Los Angeles. National Geographic Society is based in Washington D.C. Uh, they had a desire to launch a film division, um, asked me to develop a strategy for it, and then asked me to run the company to execute that strategy, where we were able to produce, distribute, um, acquire, uh, get out into the world a half dozen movies, um, of which every single one I'm very proud. Uh, oh, anyway, March of the Penguins being Mar one March that of the made Penguins, a lot of money. Uh, uh, the story of the Weeping Camel, which was also nominated for an Academy Award and won the Director's Guild Award right. for Best Documentary. Um, uh, uh, Derek uh, Joubert and um, Derek and Beverly Joubert's film, *The Last Lions*. Peter Weir's most recent film, uh, *The Way Back*. Oh, which we, I love. We had a we had a really nice run there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was about four or five years. You did that a little longer. I, I did that for seven years. Seven years. Yeah. So then we're up to the present now, and you uh, uh, you've really entered a new phase of your career. Uh, you're oh. the author of two books now. One mm. is out. Oh, let me let me dig down and get you. Inside Track for Independent Filmmakers, mm -hmm. which is, tell us about this book. Well, this is a book that I wrote because uh, since I left National Geographic and I have been working largely to help navigate the Hollywood system for independent filmmakers, I get about 50 emails a day and the emails say, can I take you out to coffee and pick your brain? I have a question to ask you. Mm -hmm. And people only have two questions. One is, how do I get money for my movie? Yeah. And the other is, I made my movie, but now what do I do with it? How do I get people to see my movie? So I wrote this book to help people figure out how to get their movie made and how to get it seen. Not how to make a movie, that's my other book, we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. But um, because these filmmakers, they, they know how to make a film, but it's mystifying. How do you put together the finance and how do you, put, how do you get distribution? And this uh, Inside Track for Independent Filmmakers, uh, which we launched at Sundance this January and has really been 
Um, it's, it's really gratifying. It's been widely adopted in the independent filmmaking community, and it's now moving into colleges and universities, uh, which is great. So it's really helping to influence the mm. next generation of filmmakers. This book, in a very uh, concise, step-by-step, no-nonsense way, teaches you how to speak financier and how to speak distributor, because they will never speak your language. You got to talk their language yeah. so they can hear what you're saying. Well, what's uh, what are some of the the challenges for independent filmmakers uh, getting distribution, getting financing uh, in the new in the new world here? I think the biggest the biggest stumping question that I ask independent filmmakers is who's your audience? Really, mm. who's your audience? Mm -hmm. Prove it to me. How do you know? If somebody says, "Oh, my audience is everybody," that's not true. Because unless you're making Iron Man four. Your audience is not everybody. You're making a, a $300,000 or a $3 million movie. Your audience is a small slice of everybody, what I call a niche. Now, that's great. There's nothing wrong with niche audiences. Those movies succeed all the time. But you make them for a, a small amount of money. Yeah. They don't have to make that much money because they weren't made for that much in the first place. Right. And um, I think the biggest problem for most independent filmmakers is being able to identify their audience clearly. Mm -hmm being able to reach that audience and communicate with them directly, right. um, and to be able to prove to us as financiers or distributors that that's the case. So if they say, my audience is, uh, I'm making a horror movie, and it's for 18 to 24 year old uh, young women who live in 12 urban markets, I'll say, okay, prove it to me. How do you know that? Right. Well, the, it seems to me that one of the advantages of the time we live in is that there's more distribution uh, channels. Yeah. We, it's not just theatrical distribution, right. but with digital technology, there's uh, other alternatives. Right. But are those viable for an independent filmmaker in terms of uh, financials? They can be completely viable if the filmmaker knows who the audience is and can address the audience, can reach that audience. I know a number of case studies where filmmakers have made hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in these direct to audience distribution channels. I call it free range distribution, actually, <laughs> um, because it is a little bit like the Wild West. Um, at the same time, even though it's all been democratized, and because it's been democratized, there's so much more content out there for audiences to try to sort through and understand what do they really want to spend their time and money experiencing. Uh, that, that presents another challenge for the filmmaker because now filmmakers also have to become their own marketing departments yep. and market themselves to their audiences. Do you think, as a, uh, if you're starting out as a filmmaker, is your goal to establish a career in independent filmmaking or is it the old thing of a calling card to get more work, studio kind of work or to get into television? What's, what are your thoughts? Where do you come down on that yeah, one? You know, I don't think it's mutually exclusive anymore. Um, in fact, you, you know, there are certain filmmakers who make movies low budget and high budget and low budget and high budget. Like look what John Favreau does. Right. Or look at what Steven Soderbergh did when he was making movies before he said I'm quitting movies and I'm yeah. not doing that anymore. Yeah. And now he's moved into television very successfully. Yeah. Uh, I think that um, filmmakers want to have a career expressing themselves in any kind of medium that they can for any yeah. kind of screen that will make them happy. The, I, was, I was always told as a, as a screenwriter coming in that the best way to get a movie made as a filmmaker mm -hmm. was to have a great script. Yeah. And I think that's probably continues to be true whether you're talking about independent films or yeah. studio films. Is that your, your sense? 100%. It all starts with the script. And when you see an independent film with big name actors in it, which we see all the time now, right. it's because the script was rock solid. Yeah. 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 Well, what are, what's the future in independent films? I, I, I've talked to you in the past about it, and I know you were very optimistic. Are you mm -hmm. still optimistic about it? I'm completely optimistic about it. I think um, there are so many movies being made. There are so many good independent movies being made, and let's not even let's not forget independent documentaries, which are stunning. I think we are in the golden age of documentary production right now. Every year at Sundance, the narrative films, the scripted films, are great but the documentaries are extraordinary. They make your jaw drop at their intelligence and artistry and beauty. So I think that we are in a great time. And the challenges of getting these movies out to audiences in a way that filmmakers can make a living from it is just, it's just hard, really hard. 
I know it is hard, but I wonder whether it's really any different from its, what it's been in the past, because getting into the studio mm -hmm. system was always hard, too, mm -hmm. and it's just a difficult field. It's yeah. art, so it it's is. always difficult. It's, it is hard, right? <laughs> yeah. It, and it's hard if you want to be a visual artist or a singer um, or anything. It's, it's very hard to make exactly. our wages exactly. from our creative expression. What's your hit on film schools and film school graduates, whether that's an, adva uh, an advantage for people coming into the business? Well, you're, first, you're speaking to a guy who teaches at a film school and has just written a book for film schools. So I'm a big, fan, I'm a big advocate of what film schools can do. Uh, also, I've worked with many directors who have never been to film school. Um, so again, I, I really think it's very much based on the individual person and what they need. Film schools can give you a great amount of information very quickly, help you learn from mentors and masters in a way that would be hard for you to figure out if you just picked up your camera and to try to do it yourself. True, although I, I think your experience at being thrown into the mm -hmm. swimming pool of uh, Disney or whatever f film uh, yeah. production company you were working on, it, it really helps to have practical experience working in the field, whether mm -hmm. you're doing internship or yeah. PA work or whatever right. Right out there. Because I know as a writer coming from the theater, the hardest thing for me to do was to understand film writing and the fact that it's a visual medium, that it involves editing, right. all these other elements that right. you don't get on uh, in a stage production. Exactly. Uh, we, they hire playwrights all the time to write scripts and right. half the time they're no good because right. if you don't know about the film vocabulary, it's not going to be a strong story. I remember once I was at Disney and we were working, uh, there was a movie that Steven Spielberg was developing. It ended up not being made. Um, see, even he doesn't have a perfect development record. It's development just hard. Yeah. And we were working with a writer who was a great character writer and she'd never written action before. And I remember Steven sitting with her and she said, but how do I write action? And he said, just close your eyes, picture what you see, and just write what you see. Exactly. Yeah. Well, they don't call it motion pictures for nothing yeah. because it really is about pictures. You need structure, you need story, you need character, mm -hmm. but you also have to think visually, yeah. which is hard for some people who are more writerly types. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, we're going to hopefully you'll be able to stay around for another segment. We'd love to do that. love to talk some more about creative entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. uh, some of the consulting that you do, and I'm also fascinated by the idea that you can apply the skills from the film and entertainment world to a whole other area, including business and education, politics even. So thank you, Adam. We'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you, Hoyt.